Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday at Union Congregational Church. Today we test whether we can do something different. <laughs> Join the happy parade. I welcome you all this morning, whether you are here with us in the assembly hall or you can't see us online because we are in the assembly hall, but we welcome you this morning as we prepare to celebrate this special day and this beginning of Holy Week together. As we begin, just a reminder, if you are uncomfortable walking outside or climbing the steps into the sanctuary from the robing room, you are free when we begin the procession to walk into the sanctuary and have a seat. Otherwise, the children with Miss Christine and Reverend Katrina are going to lead us in the procession as we sing. But before we begin, let us pray. As crowds of people welcomed Jesus when he rode into Jerusalem, acclaiming him as their ruler, so we welcome you, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Above all human powers and dominions, you lay rightful claim to our praise, our love, and our obedience. Therefore, we have come that we, with all people, might do your will on earth. Amen. Before we process, let's take a few minutes to hear Matthew's version of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Now they had come near Jerusalem and reached Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village before you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Release them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the son of woman needs them, and they will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your sovereign is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the, cr on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that were going before him and the one following were shouting, saying, Hosanna to the Son of God! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Holy One! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shook, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Here ends the reading. As we begin our procession, a reminder, if you would like, you're welcome to, pro to the sanctuary. Otherwise, we follow the children out singing Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, the little children say, through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem them close for to its breast. The children sang their praises, the blessed and the best. All of it they followed amid a cheering crowd. The victor Hosanna in your presence. 
See where they are. Oh, great! Second verse. From all of it, they followed amid a cheering crowd. The victor palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud. To the one who angels worship. Good morning, and welcome again, this time to the sanctuary. And to those of you who are joining us online, you can finally see us all. Welcome this morning. Would you please stand and join me in our call to worship? We gather together in this place, raising our branches in joy joining all who wish to see Jesus, eager for a healing touch, a blessing received. We gather together in this place, raising our branches in hope, joining all who wish to hear Jesus, longing for a message of welcome and acceptance on our journey. We gather together in this place, laying down our branches in fear, wondering if we are able to walk with Jesus through the week ahead, through anguish, accusations, despair. We gather together in this place, waving branches of prayer, walking toward the cross and the empty tomb. Thank you. 
one that the children's choir um, per, uh, made this together. Uh, we made it like several Sundays together, and it was a creation of their uh, interpretation of the words, um, including Palm Sunday. So they, we read the words together, and we shared what we thought God would prepare the way for us. So this is our gift to you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine and Children's Choir and Children's Artists for giving us such a special start to Palm Sunday. That was beautiful. Will you all join me in the prayer of transformation and new life? God of our hosannas, it would be all too easy to embrace a vision of you as entering Jerusalem with all the pomp and circumstance and violence that power provides. And yet, that is not your way. And we confess that we often whisper with the ways of fear rather than shout of your liberation for all people. Help us to lay our lives at your feet and welcome you with shouts of joy. Amen. Dear ones, embrace those words with courage. Leave your fear behind, for it does not have the last word and does not have to be the donkey you ride in on. God offers you the way of hope, humility, and hosannas. Rest in the assurance that you are forgiven and embraced in God's tender arms of love. Amen. So let us greet one another with that hope and assurance and courage that we are people of God. May the peace of Christ be with you all. With the peace of Christ, the children are also invited to lead the parade on to learning centers.
Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words that come from my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock, our redeemer, our liberator. Amen. I have to admit, this week, as I kept thinking of asking you all to join in a procession across the front of the church, singing, doing something different, what was going through my head was the old song, I Love a Parade. <laughs> the tramping of feet, every beat I hear of a drum, I love a parade. When I hear a band, I just want to stand and cheer as they come, for I love a parade. But this morning, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of parade are we witnessing? Ancient literature narrates many different scenes where ruling elite figures, whether emperors, governors, kings, military generals, ceremonially enter a city. That entry ritual is made up of either a previous military victory, they're honoring someone who has been elevated in civic life, the crowds welcome and acclaim the figure's greatness, or they're holding a religious ceremony, and there is a great and grand speech of welcome. In our context this morning, that ritual displayed central Roman values, imperial greatness, supremacy over enemies, military domination and conquest, power over as the basis of societal interactions, courage in battle, violence, submission, enslavement, and subjugation of the enemy. That spectacle that was put on as Pilate entered the city was to intimidate the subordinates and exhibit the sanction of their gods for a world of hierarchy and domination. And Pilate came to the city of Jerusalem because it was the feast of the Passover which might also, as Amy Jo Levine says, we might be reminded it is the feast of freedom, freedom from slavery and oppression. Pilate comes to make sure everything stays under control. Let's not let anybody get out of line so that tensions are running high in the city. The people, though, have expectations of liberation, of freedom, of autonomy. Jesus' entry into the city imitates this imperial practice. I've read that it was called a theological parody. The crowd hails Jesus as the king. They spread their cloaks on the ground and they wave branches. They chant Psalm 118, verse 25, which praises God for victory over the nations. And then he goes to the temple. But we have to see there are significant contrasts between the imperial processions and Jesus' procession. Jesus isn't riding a war horse decked out in all its finery but he's riding an everyday beast of burden. The folks who went on the civil rights pilgrimage were reminded of that when they visited the Martin Luther King Memorial in Atlanta and saw the mule cart that pulled his casket when he was assassinated. Crowds of common folks welcomed Jesus. There were no speeches of welcome from any of the higher-ups, the elite leaders of the city, because Jesus was not an elite figure. 
He's not authorized by the dominant ruling power to do anything that he does. But he does represent God's purposes. And that shakes everyone up. Because Jesus' focus is not on militaristic conquering, it is on the power of justice. And I find it very interesting, the Tuesday afternoon Bible study group has been going through Amy Jill Levine's book, Entering the Passion of Jesus. And she points out to us all of the things that Matthew buries within the narrative. I'm going to say buries it because sometimes we read it over and don't even pick up on it. His references to the Hebrew scriptures, particularly Zechariah 9, which celebrates God's defeat of the nations who are Israel's enemies and the subsequent establishment of God's reign. Matthew is writing in the post-70 of the Common Era, Roman-dominated world, after Rome has destroyed Jerusalem. So when he evokes Zechariah, he anticipates a future divine victory over Rome. From the gospel's perspective, Rome, their power is not absolute or final. God's victory is underway. It's predicted in Jesus' activity, but it's not yet accomplished. And for that, that sets us up today to be prepared, we see the celebration. We join the celebration. Everyone is happy to see Jesus. But he doesn't come like the others do. Zechariah's prophecy speaks of a humble, which has been pointed out to us, really means poor or afflicted. He's someone who's in authority, but he doesn't lord it over the others. Someone who takes their place with those who are suffering. He is someone who is righteous and not violent. He's able to listen to others, to share the resources that he has at hand, to prioritize community rather than authority, to serve rather than to be served. Because for Jesus, his leadership is defined in terms of servanthood. If we are to follow Jesus, we are to serve. The hallmarks of gentleness, humility, peaceableness, mercy, self-giving acts of generosity and compassion those Jesus wants us to see and he demonstrates for us, those are the marks of God's domain. So what is also subversive about this parade? The people are singing Hosanna and we hear it today as this great act of celebration. Hosanna! In the Hebrew, it comes from the root that says, save us, save us, Jesus. Take this power of Rome that is hanging over our heads, take it away, liberate us. They expect that Jesus is the promised Messiah, but he will be a military conqueror. He will be an earthly ruler. Because folks have forgotten that he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So when they say, save us, they are reminding us also in 2024 that the stain of division still permeates the fabric of our existence. We find it difficult today also to live in peace there are divisions that threaten our collective well-being. 
So what are the people asking salvation for? What do they want liberation from? The pain, despair, loneliness, poverty, and oppression. Amy Jo Levine points out to us that the idea of salvation for most of the scriptures of Israel is not about spiritual matters, but physical matters. An example being the Passover. It is salvation, liberation from slavery. But this crowd knows what they want. They want Rome overthrown. They want political reform. They want a king who is gentle and listens to them and shares resources, one that has compassion for them rather than worrying about conquering. The crowd wants what many Americans want, a balanced budget, affordable health care, affordable housing, clean water, peaceful streets, lower taxes, good schools. Don't we want the same things? We want to see things happen. But we're asked, how much are we willing to contribute in order to achieve those goals? Everything that we want comes at a price. How much are we willing to take responsibility to work and sacrifice to make those things happen? In our world, peace and reconciliation become possible when common folk with uncommon courage oppose those practices which are exclusionary and the policies that exclude others. Together they stand and they stand with the one who comes in the name of the Lord. History is full of stories of ordinary folk who recognize that they can accomplish more together than they can alone. For example, the men and women who, served, who provided safe passage on the Underground Railroad for enslaved peoples seeking freedom. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and those in the Confessing Church who took the stance that Jesus was Lord and not the Fuhrer in Germany in the 1930s. And some of us recently acquainted with Fred Shuttlesworth, Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King Jr., Pauli Murray, Amelia Boynton, Ella Baker, and so many others who banded together using principles of nonviolence to confront and disrupt the segregation and discrimination in the American South of the 1950s and 60s. And if you'd like to hear more about that, brief advertisement, be sure to come to the second hour after worship this morning. As the people are singing or saying Hosanna and saying save us, they're also saying blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It harkens back to Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, reminding us that the kingdom of heaven is here. It is now. We don't have to wait for some future time in a future hereafter. Now God asks us, create my kingdom on earth as it is in heaven now. They call him the son of David and that is what really rattles so many of the rulers in Jerusalem because they know that the son of David is the one who is to be king in Israel. They know that the son of David lays claim to the throne and they are, Rome is in charge, Herod is in charge, Pontius Pilate is responsible for keeping it all in the orbit of Rome peaceful. But here we have someone claiming to be a pretender to the throne. That can't be. 
So in the midst of celebration, the music turns to foreboding. It changes from a major key to a minor key and lets us know that something is coming and it's not going to be the greatest that we would expect. Things will change. And that is what's so different about this story. Something reminds us that the way God acts in our world is different from our expectations. There is an otherness to the way Jesus acts. The Jesus who enters Jerusalem was and always is a challenge to this world's powers and principalities. It's not a simply a spiritual challenge. It's also a political challenge. Jesus' cause is not the same as the first century zealots or any violent insurrectionists. It is not that of an aspiring political party or that of a legislative or executive agenda. But Jesus is a threat to the power elite and to the fickle crowds. Because if he doesn't come through with what they want, they will turn against him. We need to remember, Jesus didn't come in triumph like a Roman general or governor. He was not crucified and raised, and communities of believers in Jesus did not emerge in order to leave the world as they were. Some theologies have interpreted Jesus' rule as the individual soul alone, not this world, but in the next, hereafter. And frankly, that couldn't be farther from the truth. In Matthew 6, Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' cause is not like that of imperial Rome. And those that were client kings like Herod and client governors like Pontius Pilate or compliant court prophets and priests, propagandists and other hangers-on. Jesus' cause is not well served when power politics runs its course and the world's business continues as usual, even if in our present day, baptized, professing Christians replace Matthew's cast of characters. For us to envision and to promote a world here and now in keeping with the character and the way of the one called God with us is the task we are called to in every generation, including ours. May God add God's blessing. Amen.
our time of prayer, lifting up the joys and concerns of our hearts before God and in the presence of this caring community. This morning, we hold in our prayers Kate Cacciatorian, who is in the ICU at Hackensack Hospital being treated for pneumonia. We hold Kate, Armin, and their family in our prayers. We pray for Alexander, Bob and Blythe's nephew, who is suffering with debilitating migraines. We continue to pray with Reyes and Charles as Reyes undergoes treatment for cancer and hold them both in our prayers and also offer gratitude to Jeremy, who is filling in on piano this week. We continue to pray for Doris Brett, who is in hospice care, for Clarissa, Bill, Liz, Kelly, Cindy, Bob, and Dawn. Are there other prayers that those of you who are here in the sanctuary want to name aloud at this time? Prayers for the family of Lynn Wood Sykes, Mike Spinella's uncle, who passed away yesterday. Gerald? For the people of Haiti. For the people of Haiti. For the people of Gaza. Let us continue to pray. O oh Christ, you entered the city as a poor man, not in style, but humbly. Yet you still caused uproar and questions everywhere. You drew the expectations of a hungry crowd and brought buried conflicts to the surface. May we, who are sometimes, sometimes swayed by the crowd's approval and who often avoid conflict for fear of its cost to us, Hold fast to the gospel of peace and justice, and follow faithfully in your way of compassion and solidarity with those who are poor and excluded, wherever it may lead us. So God, today we remember the poor and the hungry of the world, and the role our own country has in their hunger. Praying especially for the people of Haiti and Gaza and Sudan where people are facing famine, not due to drought or flood, but because of human conflict and violence. God, we pray for the sick and the suffering of the world and ask God for mercy for them. We pray for ourselves, for our own internal and external struggles and ask you to grant us courage and grant us grace. God, we pray for our church that we would be as bold as Christ and as loving. And we pray for places near and far where ordinary people have only a facade of choice in their elections, their lives, and over their bodies. We pray too for all of creation which we crucify daily for our own comfort. God, may we have the courage to face these realities and not turn away. May we walk alongside you into this holy week, experience its depths, so that our faith and our resolve may de be deepened too. And so we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This Easter, our special Easter offering will be going to the Haitian Education and Leadership Project, which we hope you have been hearing about over the last couple of weeks. I should say that we chose this offering back in the fall, when the conditions in Haiti were not wonderful, but they were not in the severe security crisis that they are today. And yet, 
in this timely moment, we find ourselves given an opportunity to support the people of Haiti, not just in their immediate crisis, but really in building the foundation of the kind of leadership of Haitians that will lead them out to a more permanently secure future. So today we are glad to have Sam Connor, Director of Development of Help with us in worship, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the offering and the impact of their programs in Haiti. So welcome back, Sam. It's good to see you again. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to everybody for the warm invitation and for the, for the repeat invitation to, to come back. We must have done okay the first time around. Um, I'd like to um, share greetings from my colleagues Daphne and Connor, who were here with me three weeks ago. Um, uh, they were not able to, to, to join today. Daphne, in fact, who, who, who spoke from, uh, from this spot when we were here, uh, has not been able to return to Haiti because of the airports being closed, as you have probably heard. The gangs are, uh, have, have taken control of much more of the city. So I, I thought I would just share a few words about uh, what's happening on our, for our program and, and there are some reports uh, outside and I'll be around for a little while afterwards to go into detail with anybody that would like to learn more. Um, the Haitian Educational Leadership Program, just to recap, started almost 30 years ago by Connor Bohan, who was here and spoke uh, last time we were here. Uh, and he was a high school uh, volunteer, high school teacher in, in Haiti. Um, and it led to one you know, few friends and his family members chipping in and helping one person, one young woman who wanted to take a secretarial exam. Uh, just, she just wanted the bus, the bus fare to take the secretarial exam. And he said, why do you want to be a secretary? She said, I don't want to be a secretary. I want to be a doctor. But my family needs my support immediately, and this is the fastest way that I can get, get that to them. And he said, you know what, let's, let's step back and see what we can do here. And over the ensuing seven years, he and his community uh, helped this young, remarkable young woman, Is Isamon Joseph, attain her doctor um, uh, qualifications, and she became a doctor in uh, a, a clinic in Port-au-Prince. So she achieved her goal and, of course, helped her family and, and cousins and brothers and sisters, and all, now they're all have gone to college after her first-generation college student went. So now we have over 325 alumni, seven Fulbright scholars, uh, we have an additional 200 students uh, in class right now. Um, help, the Help Center, which is in Paco, uh, it, it, a little up the hill um, from the downtown Port-au-Prince, is still safe, relatively. Um, it is in the last 10 to 15 percent of, of, of Port-au-Prince that is not controlled by the gangs. Uh, there, there is a glimmer of hope. There's a, a new presidential council of five members, and several of them are quite serious people probably the most promising development politically in the past 20 years in, in Haiti. Um, and as any of you who have followed kind of humanitarian disasters and uh, relief work over the years, there's an acute phase where people want to offer food, shelter, security. In this case, I think international force will almost certainly need to come in somehow. And then there's the, 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 the transitional phase, and then there's the long-term investment. And, and we represent the long-term investment. If you would like to support uh, the Marion Wittenberg Scholarship Fund, um, we would be delighted uh, to receive your offering. This will go to fund a female scholar uh, who will help to transform the future of her country through the Haitian Educational Leadership Program, where everybody, every student gets four years of, of college education uh, of, their, of their choice in, in Haiti, whatever theme, whatever field they want to study, four years of citizenship and leadership training, uh, from us, from help, uh, four years of English, they come out, all come out fluent in English, two years of computer literacy. And these young people go on to earn 10 to 15 times the national average immediately as soon as they graduate. And over 70% of our students have remained in Haiti or alumni to make their country a better place. So at that, I'll, I think I will, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, and once again, um, happy Easter, happy Palm Sunday, and thank you again for the invitation. So we invite you to give generously, whether you give online at unionkong.org slash donate or with an offering uh, using the Easter envelopes that are in your pews today. Your offerings are gratefully received.
please join me in our prayer of dedication. God of the great shouts of hope, just as you received the voices of the crowd upon your entry into Jerusalem, receive these gifts as an expression of our joy and gratitude. Take our voices and our offerings and use them to proclaim your salvation to all people. Amen and amen. Our journey through Holy Week has begun. Uh, after worship today, those who went on the civil rights pilgrimage will be continuing the conversation in the Guild Room, probably about 11.15, 11.30. They'll share a little bit more about what they observed and learned on their trip, and then begin a conversation with you, the congregation, and the racial justice ministry team about how we bring those lessons home. What, how can we put these lessons into practice? Also after worship, Families are invited to participate in some natural Easter egg dyeing. We'll start that around 11.15 too. It'll be on the large table outside of the kitchen there. So feel free to grab some food first and, and have some coffee hour, and then we'll start those activities. This week, of course, Thursday is Maundy Thursday. We will have a special um, dinner, a simple soup supper at 6.30 in the assembly room. And then at 7, we'll move into the sanctuary for a service we're titling In Remembrance of Her, remembering the woman who anointed Jesus in his last days and who Jesus then said, well, every time we do this, we will remember you. The service will include communion and anointing. We are asking that you RSVP so that the people preparing food know how much to make. There is a link on our website and in the Thursday email, and I think, Ina, is there's a clipboard and someone will be in the assembly room so you can sign up on paper too. On Good Friday, we will have two services. At 11 a.m., we're invited to participate with Grace Presbyterian Church in a crosswalk, one of their traditions. We'll begin by the chapel doors and end at Anderson Park stopping along the way with scripture and meditation. And this is a, a service that will be outdoors, so if there are young people who want to participate, it might be um, a good service to bring younger people to. And then at 7 o'clock, uh, we will have a service of sorrow and silence here in the sanctuary. And then a week from today, on Easter morning at 6.30 a.m., we will hold a sunrise service together with Grace Presbyterian Church up at Eagle Rock Reservation near the 9-11 Memorial. It will be chilly at that hour, so come bundled up, as I have learned over the last couple of years. Uh, but it is always spectacular to watch the sun rise over the city. Um, we have a brief, relatively informal service. And of course, at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday, we will be right here in person and online with flowers and brass and special music and uh, Easter egg hunt during learning centers and all of the festivities of Easter Sunday. Related to Easter Sunday, today is the last day to turn in forms or donate online for Easter flowers or music. So we look forward to all that Holy Week will bring. Will you please stand if you are able and join us in our final hymn?
People of God, raise your branches high. Sing with shouts of joy. For Jesus has not only entered the city of Jerusalem, but into the hearts of those who are willing to walk in his ways and follow him. Go forth, not in fear, but in the courage and hope of God our creator, Jesus our brother, and the Holy Spirit our liberator. Amen.